Okay, so thank you once again, all of you, for joining us for the first SRM talk of the summer semester. Um, we have a couple of very interesting talks lined up on climate action today. Uh, before we dive into these two talks, I would uh, like to present to you uh, two of my study colleagues, or former study colleagues as I have now graduated, uh, who are going to share with you some information. The first of the two study colleagues is Rim Risky. She is going to talk to you a little about uh, initiative that she's part of on campus that's called To Empower Africa. To Empower Africa. Mm -hmm. So hi everybody. So my name is Rim and I'm also an SRM actually and I'm currently writing my thesis on electrification in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm Tunisian myself, so I'm African and I also carry this passion and drive to do something uh, for Africa. And I always feel um, driven by solving problems of developing countries <laughs> rather than uh, developed countries. So um, together with other friends and uh, colleagues, PhD students um, who share the same interests, and also the same, same motivation and love from Mama Africa. I oh, Yeah, it works. Okay. Yes, perfect. So we founded this NGO, and it's also a uh, tomb accredited um, to empower Africa. So what we envision are prosperous African communities that are energized by technology and innovation, and we want to reach this vision through research-based solutions. This is so important for us. Um, we want to touch all these goals. What we're currently doing are, we are focusing on energy water food systems. So we're basically uh, building solar panels, solar pumps, um, and we are um, we have, we're currently active in Zimbabwe in a community there where we have installed a solar system combined with a, um, a solar pump and we are um, managing the crops there. Also there is a school there, so we have this whole water, food, we have education and what is very important for us is to support the local agricultural business there through this holistic system. So we want that our system increases the agricultural productivity so that local people in this community they have they see the benefit of what we're doing there. How we, we do this exactly? We, our work is divided into three pillars. We analyze, so basically we assess the potential of the community here and we cooperate with the tool uh, on research. So basically there are a lot of uh, master students who work with us, we are using their um, findings from their master arbeiten. We're also using some PhD funding, so it's important for us, as I said, this research-based component. The second pillar is we realize we really go to the ground and we implement the system there. That's very important for us. And finally, we sustain. So <coughs> what we did, for example, I'm going to show you the picture after this, is that we, for example, do training so that the local people, they know how the system works, they really like informed so that long term we have a functional system that's not depending on what we do. And for sure we also support the operation of the system technically and also considering the social and economic perspective. So here some pictures of other students who were there. Um, and we have actually I guess some students who were there or one <laughs> student <laughs> who was in Zimbabwe in Central with Maya. So we have, for example, here they're measuring. Um, here is the solar, uh, is the water pump, the old water pump. We have like the wind anemometer. Um, we have some measurements for the soil quality. We have the whole power electronics. There is also, um, I think, the environment was it right? The uh, aquaponics system and solar panels. And this is the sustain component, as I said, like doing some workshops, also for the school there, like doing, doing some design thinking sessions and how, how can they self think about the solution in their community. 
And we have also been participated with a lot of um, papers from um, master students from Khartoum. We participated also in Lesotho and South Africa in a conference there. So on the research that we did on, on SLM, we, we, we applied there in the work. So we also tried to build this network. So where are we currently active is Zimbabwe and SLM in Central Mapaya, <laughs> mainly, and also the Tumbare. Where we want to be next, for we study from next winter semester, is in Ghana. But we also have in first contacts and potential stakeholders in Uganda and Kenya, which is probably coming maybe next year. Uh, and why am I here? I'm here because um, we really need people from SRM. <laughs> So we really need people from sustainable resource management because in the near future we're gonna do we have a biogas um, station that we want to maintain there. So we need people who from the renewable energy field, bioenergy specialization. We also we're gonna focus on the agriculture component. So we also want experts also on food and agriculture. Um, and it's like in general, really open for SM students, we want them. We're sitting in Gashi, so a bit far, but like we want SRM, and I'm here like <laughs> fighting for that. And, and um, but for sure, as you saw the goals in this third slide, we open for all people interested in, in our work. And if anyone of you is interested, we're having our next event next Thursday already. It's called the Empower Africa Night. Um, the main topic there is about what kind of business solution, social driven business solution can we think of for Africa. But we're going to have also a keynote on, I don't know if you know, there is an official TUM Africa strategy. So we're going to have a professor presenting what, why is TUM interested in Africa first. And then we're going to have six panelists. And it's here which are most from the um, entrepreneurship sector. So like we have three CEOs, CIOs from some startups or small companies like Africa Green Tech, Podashta and Powerworks. We have also the CIO of um, uh, Unis Business Foundation. That can comment, um, comment you this, right? I don't know if like, the microphone is uh, and we have also two uh, from the academia, we have Professor Wells mm -hmm. from the Cocoa Sustainability and how Herman, which is doing research, is opposed to doing research on water energy food systems. So anyone of you who wants to attend, grab your <laughs> phones and you can screen the, the QR code and uh, you're going to be directed directly to the event. But for sure, if you want to have more details or more, more you can approach me afterwards in the break and I can give you more information. But these are anyway my contact data if you want you can save them and that's it from my side. <laughs> It might be interesting for the audience to know that Brim is also in fact a co-founder of the SRM Talks. Very quick, I just have a quick question for you. Most of you study SRM, or are at least interested in SRM related topics. Has any of you worked in an organization already that is related with SRM in topics, for instance, environment, sustainability, anything? Some of you may have done internships, or anything. If anybody feels that they have something that they could like, would like to share with the other SRM members, please just approach me. We're trying to organize an event where we share all the knowledge that is already existent in the SRM students, or also possibly um, SRM alumni. Just talk to me after, or yeah, after the talk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I assume that most of you have received a, a semester calendar for SRM talks. Uh, as you can see here, there are some changes to that that have happened in the meanwhile. Uh, so we have changed, revised the date of the main SRM talk 
it's no longer happening on the 29th, but on the 22nd. Uh, also, the talk in July is not happening on the 24th, as it said, but on the 10th of July. So I'm just putting these dates up so that if you are planning your spring and summer, you might want to uh, check the dates again. Thank you. And with that, we can move on to the main event of the evening. And that, as you know, is uh, talks on climate today. And uh, what each talk is, we'll come to in a while, but I just wanted you to know uh, how, how we get how we are scheduled. We are running at like 15 minutes late, uh, but we have uh, the two talks with a short break in between, followed by the Q&A and the networking dinner, the usual pattern for those of you who have attended SIR talks before. And uh, without wasting any more time, I would invite our first speaker of the afternoon, Dr. Werner Kraus. Dr. Kraus is a faculty member at the University of Bremen. He's an environment anthropologist. Areas of his interest include anthropology, anthropocene, and political ecology. He is also trying to bring forth the uh, discussion around uh, how the knowledge on climate is produced or the politics of climate is produced uh, through his web-based blog that he calls uh, the Klima Sleeper, Climate Onion. Maybe uh, we can tell you why he calls it that later. Uh, he, as an academician, has also published uh, quite a few papers. But one of his most prominent ones is a book which he calls the Precarious vicinity of climate research and politics. Again, some terms that I'm not familiar with, so you can explain that. And uh, some other feathers in his cap are that he was also uh, instrumental in producing the IPCC Annual Report 5, Working Group 2. And then most recently, he successfully concluded a fellowship at the Rachel Carson Center in Europe, which is where I happen to have met him. <laughs> and I'm very happy that today he makes his journey all the way from his home in Hamburg to deliver his talk. And on behalf of the study program division of Forest and Research Center, I welcome you here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I meet you in a second. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, hi, thank you very much for having me. Great to come to Munich back again. It's pretty long way from Hamburg, so it's <laughs> not like they used to be. It's somewhat longer. So I'm going to talk about uh, climate change as discourse and practice in coastal landscapes. So uh, you're specialists on that, of course, climate change is a fact. But whatever that means, what a fact is, climate change is a discourse, something we permanently talk about, think about, as part of our life, our world, and we're going to talk about that as a discourse. And it is something like, it's a practice. You are practitioners in terms of climate change, sustainability, engineers are practitioners. We are practitioners in our daily lives, we don't need anymore, we ride our bikes, we world of climate change. When I talk about coastal landscapes, then it's because I uh, conduct field work for about uh, 20 years now, not all the time, but again and again at the German North Sea Coast. So I'm going to talk about the German North Sea Coast line. The first part of my talk is about global climate change. Climate change is always global. And I have to bring it down into the real world, to a concrete place. The second part parts of concrete places and people deal with climate change. Then, I had no idea who I'm talking to, which is always difficult. So I didn't prepare a manuscript. So I hope I can deal with the time. Of course, I have slides and I follow the slides. It makes a difference if you talk to your own community of anthropologists or if you talk to SRM people and study to your posters outside. So you really do practical work in concrete places, engineering. I'm an anthropologist. Anthropologists are simply curious. They do a lot of basic research. Just watching what people are doing. They like to watch you too. What you are doing. So that's different. I'm from the humanities. 
communities are somewhere in between. We are not very practical, whatever that means being practical. We got involved in the climate business sooner or later, but it took a long time because climate is serious business for real scientists with real graphs and numbers and models and everything, which we do not use very much. We're interested in it. We talk about it. That's what I'm going to do. When I was preparing my talk, there was the talk of Greta Thun Thunberg, the European Parliament, and I watched this. And I got confused. And my plans crashed for this talk somehow because I think that is. I wanted to figure out what is interesting about it. Something caught me, caught my attention. <coughs> so I thought we watched it for two minutes as a start. Oh, we don't have speakers in this room. I'm relying yeah. on the quality of my laptop speakers. Let's see if it works. <laughs> it, I think it has subtitles. Yeah. So. Did you have to do the sound? Something uh, like universities and things like that never managed to deal with complicated <laughs> videos. It's too new. Never change. I'm sorry? Try refreshing it. There's something we wrote Okay, you can read the subtitles <laughs> before. I've said those words before, a lot of people have explained it. Ah, it started with, we need to panic. Okay, without a sound, I think we can stop it here. Did you see it, on, uh, especially in this uh, presentation in front of the European Parliament? It was, uh, it's always moving to see her, I think. But she was almost crying when she was talking about mass extinction. Her voice was in the neck. I was very impressed by... I, 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 give, I was preparing to talk about climate change as this course. This course means talking. And Greta suggests stop everything, stop talking, and act, and and, and do something. And how that is a stunning idea. I think that's the power of her. She says, we know everything, we know what the problem is. Almost nobody doubts it, there are skeptics around it, so no one really doubts it, what's going on. We know what we have to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Isn't that? No. But obviously we don't. And that's kind of interesting. 
but we talk all the time about it. And so I think that we, that we really have to think about that, because it is clueless. It is, I have no idea what to do about this. I, mean, I came here by train today, which is pretty fair in terms of my current footprint. But next week I fly to France to give a talk about climate, by the way. I fly my airplane because it's a 12-hour train ride. And the week after that I go to Sheffield in London, and it's about a 10-hour train ride. And I fly again because it's two hours and they pay for me. That's me. Maybe you are more confident than yourself. It's very difficult. You should stop talking, but you can't stop talking and give a talk. It's very difficult. This course is a specialty in philosophy. It came out in the 1670s of the last century, and uh, mostly through Michel Foucault, who was a philosopher. And he was interested in how this course is, how we as persons, as collectives, as nations, are formed by very powerful discourses, which mostly come from science, which made a we are. And one of his most famous books, The Order of Things, the last sentence in it, one of the last ones is, man will be erased like a face drawn in the sand at the edge of the sea. I'm not sure if he knew about climate change in the 70s or 80s, maybe, but he didn't think about climate change. And I always uh, try to figure out what does he mean by that. It's a very strange sentence. And uh, last year I was on Canary Island for holidays and I could not face the edge of the sea into the sand and waited for the flood to come in and wipe it away and I thought, oh, that's like, yeah. Maybe uh, the climate change discourse, data is talking about the sea's extinction. We're all going to die, we're going to disappear. We're only a species like dinosaurs, like like those frogs in South America, which will disappear, like, like other, other species will disappear. But I'm not sure if he's talking about that. Maybe he's, maybe he's talking about something else which is slightly interesting, and that is, for him, man is a construction of discourses. He's a structuralist thinker. So we have to figure out what discourses are. We do invent ourselves more or less, but in, inside of certain limits, inside of uh, shaped by discourses. So, Plato says discourses have to come to an end. We have to panic. Panic is when we stop thinking about it. It's a very strange state. I'm sure you have been in panic too, when something's happening in an accident or whatever. You stop thinking. And she sees it as a kind of freedom to stop thinking. Michel Foucault all his life tried to figure out is there life outside of these courses? Can we decide what we ourselves want to do or is it always a discourse for the end? So this course is a mode of knowledge, a way of knowledge about certain things. About certain things like we all know what uh, climate is, we all know what nature is, we know what sexuality is. Was one of his, uh, he wrote a book about the discourse on sex. Sexuality was invented in the 18th century or so. It was kind of invented in academy. It was separated from family, from the production, from clans, from societal. Before that, people didn't really have sex. They only had it after university discovered it. <laughs> Circle of disciplines around it, like biology, like psychology, like genealogy, <laughs> disciplines. Yeah, totally. He says we are totally obsessed by sexuality and a thing called sex. The difference between men and women because of their sex, in a sense, in general. And uh, he wrote that book in the 60s about sexuality. Everybody was talking about we have to free our sex. Finally, uh, we are only free when our sex is free, when we have good sex, when we have sex partners. 
in a satisfying way. We buy clothes, we buy dresses, we make ourselves up to have good sex. We want to be normal, we want to have normal sex like everybody else. We have a strong desire to be normal, which is channeled through our desire to have good sex. He said, why free sex? When you look at TV, when you look at ads, when you look everywhere, it's sex, you know, it's pure sex. He said, why do you want even to free it? And he had the idea that discourses on certain topics, like nature, like prisons, like psychology, like sexuality, are forms of biopower. Our bodies are connected through the desire like everybody else, to be like the others, to be normal. We are connected, we are linked to power. When we have desires, our desires are shaped by, in the 60s it was, he was a homosexual, it was dangerous to be homosexual. So he knew what he was talking about. He had a desire to be normal. The world has to be normal. He says, uh, that is how we are structured through powerful discourses to shape our sense of community. These discourses are collectively shared by the human national identities are based on shared discourses. And when we climb in such a body of knowledge, which links us all together in our everyday activities, in our collective activities, in our community, Climate is something that creeps in all parts of our life, everywhere. That is the idea of discourse. Man is a race someday, the edge of the sea. Maybe, uh, maybe we are on the verge of something else. Maybe these discourses are really discourses of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. Maybe there will be new discourses. Maybe climate change is already a new discourse which changes the form of biopower of the need to the collective. Climate change reminds us very much that the world has animated our air, that we live together on the sea and mountains and animals and winds and storms and everything, that we are not alone out there, that we are not only people with a sense and identity. Uh, regional identity, a national identity, and something like that. Maybe we are something else, something post-human. We are already people who live on technology very much. Many people are like cyborgs and with machines. People, there's a lot of talk about neurophysiology, about bacteria, about everything. We are not alone here. We are maybe not that subject which is isolated with its desires to participate in power. Maybe we are on the verge of something else with climate change, against climate discourse and climate change an interesting topic. I admit it's a strange approach to climate change. When I was preparing the talk, I stumbled across great talents and I stumbled across my own desire. I said, oh my god, there's are engineers here. People who do something useful in the world help to to climate change, to mitigate climate change, to help the oppressed, to help other people, to do environmental justice, things I want to do, but I need the message, I need something really constructive. But when I talk about now, I'm an anthropologist. I, I do research on climate change for 20 years now. And uh, anthropologists are in a certain way different. That, uh, We try to observe what is happening. And we participate in that. We try to figure out how it feels, how that is. And we try to think, we watch people doing things. So, uh, in terms of talking about climate change, it's always difficult not to be constructive, not to bring a new idea, not to tell you what to do, how to better the world. But now I want to stay aside and talk about what are we doing all the time, what is going on here, and maybe then we can learn something from that. Okay, so I'm, uh, here's a short overview, and the 
I first talk a little bit about anthropology. I'm not sure if you're familiar with anthropology. I'm going to talk about global climate change discourse, like you're all familiar with. I will have a closer look at it. And I will talk about the Anthropocene. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's uh, how our epoch, how our geological age is stuck currently. There's a discussion about it. And then I switch to my own fieldwork at the German North Sea Coast and will uh, give you some examples how people there uh, deal with the challenge of climate change and to live within an exposed and, exposed and endangered landscape. <coughs> so what is anthropology? Um, anthropologists uh, study in a very general way what it means to be human across different cultures, societies, and environments. What does it mean to be human? It's different in many places, of course. It's different everywhere. We always think everybody thinks like us, but uh, we come from so many places, and if you go to, to the Arctic, and to the Inuit people who live on the year in ice, and how uh, we to 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 birds, it's different cosmologies, different worldviews, different ideas, what it means to be human. What is it to be a man like Foucault said, no one says that the sex is the same man. What does it mean to be a human? And environmental anthropologists, um, of course you have to talk about the environment people live in if you try to figure out what it, means, uh, what it feels like to be human. Anthropologists specialized, especially on the environment, on the landscapes, on the relationships, how the ice, the desert, the forest shape our feelings, our senses of selves, and how we shape, inhabit, and administer them, the forth and back to the outside world and us, the permanent, the permanent influence, and of course that has to do with who owns what. It means something different to be human if you're a slave, or if you're a slave owner, if you're a farmer, or if you're a citizen, if you're some political ecology, of course. Today, in terms of climate change and ecology, uh, we look very much at if there is a conflict about wolves now, for example. Even in northern Germany, we have wolves. Who's talking about the wolf? What does the wild mean? Who assembles around that discourse about the wolf and about the animal? the communities and the European Union is involved and the hunters are involved and the reader of fairy tales are involved and they all assemble around the wolf and then they form society and have ideas what it means to be human. It's not like us to have wolves, people in our churches. It's interesting, right? it's people who like to live without wolves. In the second part I'm going to give you examples from my field work. I worked a lot uh, in Portugal and in Germany about the implementation of national parks and com conflicts with resident people. When I was a student, I was green and wanted to help ecologists to implement, for uh, example, national parks, nature reserves, and everything. My first year from in Portugal, I found people, uh, nice people, who lived there, and they were totally comfortable with uh, nature conservation. Conservationists that are interested in that. Why that? And then I met the same phenomenon in northern Germany. Then I studied uh, ecology and climate even more. Scientists play a central role in the formation of these processes and our understanding what that is. It's climate scientists who tell us what climate change is. It's the ecologist, the biologist, whatever, who tells us what nature is. <laughs> so I started to study scientists. I conducted field work in a research center close to Hamburg where climate scientists are and I followed them like a, like a tribe. I followed the tribe of climate scientists and we wrote a book together with climate scientists about climate science, the production of knowledge. Where do we know from what we know about climate change? From Hamburg in a research institute with the second largest computer in the world for us, certain time at least. That's where we know from. So it was interesting. Global climate change is global. Climate science has difficulties to localize. Local localization of weather. But people on local places are obsessed with climate change, like 
Mm -hmm. So I had a field work that exposed landscapes in northern Germany to figure out what climate change to live. And currently I will talk about a project I'm currently in about climate change. So the global climate discourse. Climate change came to us as a catastrophe. We have here the famous iconic title on the Spiegel, the German journal, the German weekly, in 1986 already, they had the climate catastrophe, something's going on. It was scientists telling us. This year I found last week, it's 5 past 12. In English you say it's past uh, high time, it's too late already. Question mark. It's a for a conference in Bremen. You see here Bremen in the water. Which is more realistic than Cologne because Cologne is on the Rhine. <laughs> <laughs> it's very metaphorical. Bremen is closer to the sea, so anyway, it's still a catastrophe. And it's still already too late now. But it was ten times too late in between. We only have ten years time, eleven years, I think, great says now. But in 86 we had 20 years, and 10 years later we had 15 years. And everybody was busy to make new plans, new policy treatments, new Kyoto Treaty, new scenarios, new models, how we can. Currently we have 12 years time to get the 1930, uh, 2030 things. We know we will never make it, of course, but we are very busy in doing it, and we are all involved. I get money for that too, I think, from the European Union. While we are financing Going on, the world is going down. It's going down, it's frightening, by the way. That's <coughs> it's cynical and it's frightening. I'm completely clueless about that. <coughs> so, uh, Antje Hartmann Schellenhuber is maybe the uh, most famous German climate scientist. He's a advisor of the Pope and of Angela Merkel. And, uh, the, he was until recently the head of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research, something like that. And uh, he says, the world is like the Titanic, it's sinking. And when the Titanic is sinking, there's no time for rearranging the deck chairs. A little bit like Greta, stop talking. We, we, we have to, to save the world first. Climate change is like a Titanic. Of course, there are other problems on board too, but when we do not come to terms with climate change, we do not keep the ships swimming, we do not have to reflect on social inequality, racism in our country stuff anymore. So shut up, people from the humanity, stop talking. You are know, serious people have to save the ship. And that is very much so, because climate science is incredibly powerful in that whole. Uh, in that whole discourse in relation to politics and in relation to the public perception of climate change. We are permanently confronted with that catastrophe. And with that idea that there is kind of geoengineering, if it's possible, the world has some points, they identified it, like the uh, tipping points online, how much time. You turn a little bit here, turn a little bit there, and then it's cool, and then we can talk about social inequality and so on. Yes, as an anthropologist, I say yes, but the fossil fools which pollute the world are mostly in areas where indigenous people live or where uh, African American people live, like the close to Houston in the uh, United States or in Nigeria, for example. <coughs> Pollution has a lot to do with social inequality, but in climate change discourse, um, it's a powerful way to say it, but it's anyway different from Greta, I think, what he says. I don't know if he makes the same action. What Shannon Hooper does here in climate change discourse does very much is turning political problems, which are a matter of politics, like bad politics, like corruption and all that stuff, into a technological problem, and nourishing the fantasy we can geoengineer and uh, maybe they ask us to social engineer to tell you what to, how to treat the world correctly that to solve this problem. Very critical of this is the uh, Indian writer Amitav Ghosh, who wrote a wonderful book, The Great Derangement. And uh, he's a writer, literary scholar too, and 
the REC, uh, you know, the IPCC, the World Climate Report, where uh, the review of what we know in terms of physicists uh, about climate change, he read it as a text. And two years ago, there was the encyclical by the Pope Francis about climate change and the environment. Laudato si, in the care of our own home. It was interesting to read it, uh, not in terms this is scientifically correct, both are, of course, and there is no doubt scientifically correct. Both are advised by Shell, who, for example, is a test scientist. But it's text too, which gives us a sense of the world we inhabit, we live in. You know, it's a discourse. Even scientists produce discourses. They say it's not discourse, it's facts we present. But facts have to present it with words. So Amit, of course, wrote about uh, the IPCC. The diction of the agreement is borrowed directly from the free trade agreement of the neoliberal era with its references to accelerating, encouraging, and innate innovation. Many of the terms on which it relies, such as stakeholder, good practices, insurance solutions, public and private participation, technology development, decision-making, and so on. Those terms are all familiar to you, but it's a world of you. Do they exactly know how decisions are made? Or is there a world where famous scientists and politicians point to you and say, you are the decision-maker? What does a stakeholder mean? What, what is a stake exactly? Is it property in terms of finances, or of land, or of charisma, or of... Who, who runs as a stakeholder? What are good practices? Who is defining it? We live in a world with insurances, of course. Public and private participation. Our universities are today very poor caricatures of neoliberal industries, I think. 80% in German universities, of people who work in universities, do not have permanent contracts with two years or three years and then they're fired. Unless they do a job that fits well into that world, and then maybe they have another two or three years, and maybe one out of 100 or 200 or three or thousand will get a permanent position. It's like a caricature of a neoliberal agenda. That's what we all work in. I know what I'm talking about. So he was reading uh, the book by the Pope. That's a quote from the Pope. Friends of Assisi helps us to see that an integral ecology calls for openness to categories which transcend the language of mathematics and biology and take us to the heart of what it is to be human. It's a totally different talk. He wants to break through scientific <coughs> The professionals, opinion makers, communications, media, and centers of power being located in affluent urban areas are far removed from the poor. Little direct contact with the problems. They live in reason from a comfortable position. So it's a kind of social critique. He talks a lot about uh, environmental justice. He talks. He says we cannot tackle climate change. We do not tackle social inequality. The scandal of the poor. The scandal of misery all around the world that we produce by the way. We have to address it. It's the total opposite of what Shannon who was said before. By the way, Shannon who advised Pope Francis. The tricky thing about discourses is they are never uniform. It does not go in a global climate change discourse. Even skeptics are part of it. More than others, because skeptics are totally obsessed by climate change. They talk permanently about it. This causes is when your identity, when your profession, when your life is circled around something in the moment. So there's always a counter discourse to something. So Pope Francis says, says, says empathy, compassion, be attentive to the world outside. It's a very different discourse, and Amita Gosh sympathizes very much with what I'd like to see. Well, as uh, you can you mention the beginning? I studied the tribe of climate scientists uh, and I even stalked on my partner Hans von Storch, who's a famous German climate scientist. I really was uh, he's traveling around the world once a year as a climate scientist to conferences to arrange money for his institute, to give interviews, he's on TV, he's involved in scandals. Climate science is a permanent scandal of powerful people fighting each other. 
prophecy by the imams were hacked there, insisting that everybody has to be silenced to criticize his client, whatever, this exciting world. He was interested, he understood what I want. He contributed the scientific details that it's correct. I told the story of his crazy life. And we both, while writing this book, I realized, oh my God, I, my great grandfather already wrote a book about climate change and it was published in 1900. I think it's great grandfather. Yes, it was published in 1900. He comes from the south of Germany, where I grew up too, the Lake of Constance, where we see the glaciers. And he became an amateur scientist and many people of independent means became them. And he wondered what, so what about the glaciers, the epochs? Time, how does it work? And he got it right with climate change. Already in 1900, the basic knowledge related <coughs> to a climate scientist who says, Yeah, it's beautifully written, it's correct. He knew what it's about. And on this picture here, you see, uh, this is the town I grew up in, and it's uh, here. It's a bit difficult to see. You see the towers, it's underwater. It's a friend of him, I uh, wrote it to him as a joke, and he says, Look, that will happen when, when uh, the world is getting warmer rapidly. The world will be in the water. You remember the pictures in the beginning of the cathedral of Cologne or of Bremen? That was in 1900. Climate science has a long, long history, which is hardly aware. And climate itself has a long history, which is closely related to our human history. We permanently live in geological times. We are connected to these things, to glaciers, and to geology, and to the politics. So uh, we were impressed by the historicity and the materiality of climate change. It's not only a discourse, but it's something, when you look at the Alps and glaciers, you can see something, you can imagine climate change and all that stuff. And we figured out it happens somewhere. It always happens somewhere. It's global, but if you want to know what it is, it must be somewhere, and it originates from somewhere. It's good to make climate models, otherwise we would not know. It's good to downscale, otherwise we would not know. But you have to go somewhere to figure out what it is. You need the case study. That was our conclusion, more or less. If you want to tackle climate change, you have to do it exactly. But my great grandfather didn't know yet. He was living in the Holocene. Holocene, I think 10,000 years or something, with a relatively stable climate. My uh, civilization was blossom and everything, it went up and down a little bit. It's the obviously curve and stick, which is more or less leveled, and then only in the past 60 years or so it goes up. Past 60 years, past 100 years. Well, there's nothing out in this world which is not influenced by us. You can see humans are an ideological force. That is what Stroma and Crutzen are. Crutzen, I think, uh, said in the, somewhere, I forgot, in the 80s, 90s. Everywhere. We do not live in the Holocene anymore. There's no world outside, we're always inside. Everywhere we look, when you look at climate change, we see not climate outside, but we see our imprint on climate. It's a game changer. Geologists discuss about it. Is that true? Is it really uh, worth calling it or not? But I think it is worth so getting there. And it has enormous intellectual consequences, which are geolog geologists are not that interested in. But what everybody's interested in, when did that start? When did the game change? And the favorite for everyone is the Industrial Revolution, of course, in England. And the steam engine was invented, and carbon emissions went up and everything. But then after a while, others came and said, no, it was the colonization of the Americas when the forests were clean, when the moon countries and the reasons were clear, the biosphere changed totally through colonization. Others say in a more philosophical tone, no, it was the, it should be called the capitalist scene, when capitalism really emerged and everything was measured in terms of money and salt and all that stuff, when capital came and went off. Life in the ecosystem, in the ecosystem, there's nothing that's not capitalized anymore. It's not an idea, it's really, you can sell everything. You are worth something, or not. Well, anyway, uh, 
In the humanities, we like that term very much because we do not care very much about if something's true or not, if it's really proven in science or not. It's good to think with. And uh, famous anthropologists like Anna Tsing says, we live uh, life in the ruins <coughs> of capitalism. That's where we try to be human. We look at a house of shit full of disaster, and that's where we be trying to be human. I was saying, like Bruno Latour, for example, no, uh, it's totally different. Um, we are part of a web permanently involving the self creating web of Gaia. <coughs> Goddess, not like the goddess. Gaia of an ecosystem, a kind of self producing ecosystem. We are involved. We are like Foucault said in the beginning, no more really humans, but we are organisms in a web of organisms. We are connected, we are multi species, we are post human, those are fancy terms which are discussed in the humanities. Anyway, the anthropo anthropocene is a good to do case studies to get back to Earth, what does it mean down to Earth, what does it mean to be human, to, to realize where we live. So, 10 minutes? Yes. Yes. So, only shortly about my field work. We go to certain places. I conducted field work in northern Germany, the spectacular coast of northern Germany, northern Friesland, light gloriously rotten sea a tidal flat area and all the land you see you can see it on the next slide better a different example here it's the so-called Hamburg Hallig here you can see the gray that's the light line the green is the salt meadows which are uh, coming to being through the uh, sedimentation the floods coming in and out and leave uh, sands and you can see the land you can see the with slight blue lines. This is all land reclaimed from the sea. It started about a thousand years ago or so. It was colonization of the Frisians of this landscape. The sea went far into the tidal flat and far into the inland. Storm floods again and again destroyed dikes and everything. But people were reclaiming the land and pushing it forward. It's very good to think with this landscape. It's constructed. It's a constructed landscape. It's not nature. Nature is in there. But without human effort, this landscape would not exist, and you have to permanently put effort into it to keep it alive. Climate change is bad news there, of course, um, for two reasons. One is the rise of sea level, and the uh, more intense storm flooding come in, which is a problem for the diets. It's protected by a diet line, which are now 11 meters high. The study is 2 meters or so. It's now 11 meters. It's difficult to get higher. It's already roll-over dikes, so the water can roll over the dikes without breaking the dikes and the flooding parts of the land. The height challenge even is on the land because most of it is below sea level or on sea level. It's totally flat. It's full of water and rains, and it rains all the time. It's in the drainage systems. So we have this highly specialized culture, which is deeply ingrained in administration and social institutions. It's a diet suit society. You have to maintain the diets, and you have to maintain drainage, and you have to work together with the tides, and the water, and the wind, and the weather, and the storms. It's hard to talk about, it's organized. It's Germany, it works pretty well. It's amazing, really. The green part here, this part uh, broke up and then for green. When there was a storm flood in the 17th or 18th century, it broke from another island, the so called Halik, a small island. People connected it with the dam to the mainland. You see the sedimentation process along the. It's normally uh, people would reclaim that land and make new farms, but nature conservation, the national park was founded in the 80s and 86. Green young people from the universities came to northern Germany and said it's nature, so marshes are valuable, there are species of extinction, and they stopped the land regulation process and implemented the national park. There were huge discussions about it. People said, no, it's not nature, it's culture. It was a formerly, uh, all of this here, there, there, were, there were churches on the water, 
far as I can imagine. It's terrible. No, it's nature. Big fight going on. About 10 years. This is a fight. And I did something wonderful. The National Park and local residents, they built a working group which met once in a month for two or three years in a small island to discuss matters of concern. What this is this all about here? They discussed about the tides, about storm floods, about <coughs> migratory birds, about salt marshes, about birds, sheep birds, about the restaurant, everything. It was basic democracy. Not only among humans, there's an interaction between humans and non-humans. The outside world had a saying through biologists, through rangers, through NGOs, through everything. And finally they found a solution. So uh, there's restricted access to this island for the local res residents. And most of all, there's a barrier, a barrier that separates nature from culture. I was proud to found it because there are libraries and books about it, about where's the difference between nature and culture, and nature and culture. You can see it here. You drop five euros into it, and the barrier opens, and you drive from culture into nature. Culture and nature are discourses. But all of society, they are not out there. That is what we can learn. Unfortunately, people do not remember the process, how that came to be. It was a very democratic, eco-democratic process, which I think is still a role model now to deal with the outside world. It was discussed over years and years until compromises and solutions were found. And animals and lives and wind and all that non-human stuff had a saying in it. It's a matter of concern to was recognized. The boring of the world is, uh, last year, climate scientists came over and occupied part of the salt marshes and they had their laboratories and they measure the wind and everything and will tell us how climate change will affect this island. And they will take, countries will take measures, there will be conflicts and hopefully they will have a working group like this again to deal with these conflicts. So how to find out something about climate change? We have a, currently a European Union finance project in five countries. It is about the communication between climate science and local populations. Climate science can tell people at the coast that the uh, storm floods will be more intense, that the level will rise between one and six meters, and that information like that. Engineers know that, engineers can use it. But how to live with climate change? People want to act, want to do something. They are permanently educated by everyone. Even people who believe in climate change are treated by us like skeptics. We have to do this and this and this. And we thought we'd do it the other way around. Right? We ask people, what do you know about climate change? What are the effects of climate change? How do we live with climate? How do we live with weather? What kind of weather world do we live in? Which is spectacular in this area. This is reclaimed land, which was totally flooded. So uh, we, were, we are eager in finding narratives of change and trying to combine that with scientific data, to make scientific data focused, useful, to put science into another place, away from the big educator of people, to someone who walks around you know, to people's concerns and help to protest them. For me as an anthropologist, I get deep hanging out as we do. Uh, I live there on a biological farm for one year where I just talk with people. I went to the mayor of the city and I went to the national park and uh, to dike inspection. And you see this strange area here. It's a bite coming into the sea, the bloody reason. Contained by dikes development. So what do people think about uh, Climate change. I, I, I was in a cynical way lucky because when I came, it was an endlessly rainy winter. It was raining. People, the farmers could not go on the fields because it's marshes. You cannot go with the tractor. You cannot go with the wheel. Drowning in the manure of the cattle they have. They could not bring it out. Everybody said, hey, that's climate change. It was followed by an endless summer by a drought from 
you know, April to October, it did not rain almost. People said, yeah, that is climate change. And that is the European Union, they said, because uh, monocultures are supported uh, with subsidies from more subsidies than organic farms. Organic farms have not so much problem because they have diversified goods on their fields. They were talking about politics immediately when we talk about climate change. How politics should change. Conventional farmers discussed with industrial farmers. There's discussions going on. All of Germany was discussing agriculture for the first time for a long time. That is what climate change did, which is interesting. Climate change already is there in form of the energy transition. It's been the area, it's been half of German, of the German energy transition. It's full of wind power. Everybody wants renewable energies. The change the landscape completely together with biogas. So uh, before that, there were about 10% of the population working in farms, now it's about 3%, because uh, farms give up, land is getting too expensive. People from Munich, from Schwabi, buy up land there to produce corn for the biogas tanks. It's a fortune. And the small farmer living there, that's normally small farmers with 200 cattle or so, they cannot afford to, 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 to live there anymore. Because of climate change, because of renewable energies, because of others uh, went together and made their own wind parks and made a good deal out of it. Cambridge, it's everywhere there. It was a surprise. Uh, we always have the tendency to educate people, but there the future is already happening. And we can learn how it is and what happens if you have a neoliberal climate change policy. It's pretty cruel. It's pretty tough. By the way, emissions in Germany go up, not down. Is that true? That's true. The future happens already there. In another way, too, the apocalypse, the catastrophe, the panic, it was there in the form of devastating storm floods in the 11th, 13th, 15th, 17th uh, century. This year was the 300 year commemoration of the 1717 Christmas flood. They commemorate this, it's full of landmarks, this area. They know how dangerous it is to live there. There were priests from the church giving the talks, which is enormously interesting. Because they said in 1717, uh, people were discussing it because we did not behave correctly, we squatted punishments. It was such that there were chronicles about that. It was a horrible death to get flooded. It takes a long time, you die of cold. Some children drowned, they, they were recitals. It's a cruel part, but the priests have done the worry. Nowadays, God is our friend, his compassion consoles us and walks with you. It's a good God. In the end, said, by the way, it was close to Christmas, I do not order with Amazon because the carbon footprint is bad. So you can see in the narratives how times change, how church intervenes, how God changes. It's different. It means something else to be human today than 200 or 115 years ago. Here you see a. Tiger Zoo Society. It's a zoo here, powerful tidal gates. So uh, when there's low tide, the water from the inland flows out into the sea when the tide comes in. It's huge. It was close. You see the Jade Bay here, it falls completely dry, twice a day. It's a very boring sea. It seems there only two times two hours a day. It's really strange. It's a huge mud flat. I did a test and watched it. 12 hours to come kind of flood. I was just watching what's going on. It's the geology that worked, tides that work. I was uh, reading Bruno Latour's new manifesto, Down to Earth, which fits well. He's talking about we should tell much new stories, we should realize that we are closely connected to climate to everything. It's kind of beautiful and interesting. You see the diet inspection and which all that is happening in the year. Mostly men, they inspect the dikes, they touch the soil, they discuss the quality of the soil, they tell you everything. People in the is it's from the rich people, people in the have been poor, most poor have been 
living on the same soils, how that changed with biogas and wind turbines, then uh, who possesses what, it's political ecology life. It's really me learning from them about how the world functions and what it means to be human in this area. And climate change, of course, is a fact for them. It's a very impressive fact. You see here a landmark. These are flat stones. Uh, they are on the dike, and that's loose, and they hate original height, five meters, six meters, and so on. But it's stones brought from the inland, because we have a, this stone here was 20 kilometers in the inland. In between, people have reclaimed land. So the stone was landing, uh, standing inside. So they put it here, like in the museum, an outside museum. And I got this photo from one of the dike inspectors, and you see here the, what do you call that, the scroll from the sea, above the flood of 2006. And the dike inspector said, uh, he panicked for a moment. He said, oh God, that's climate change. It's much higher than you know, those, during those horrible floods way back when. It's those places where you get the historicity and materiality of climate change, where climate change is something real and not only a model or a scenario or something like that. What does it mean to be human in this area? I uh, was a time when the refugees came to Germany, we had a demonstration on the diet, uh, they were welcome refugees, there were a lot of refugees, they treat them very well. They invest a lot in photovoltaic, many of them can vegan and vegetarians, they can buy organic shops, they ride bicycles, yeah, like you, it's a people talk about climate change, the discourse of climate change. I mean, what does it mean to live in a climate friendly, down to earth, and cosmopolitical world? Cosmopolitical is important because of the refugees and all those people living there, they voted for 90% of the fascists uh, in the 1930s. Land reclamation, fighting against nature and the sea. That's gone. It's great that they are welcoming the refugees today. It's all, it, it all belongs together. It's so climate friendly. What does it mean? People like to discuss with us. We have in two weeks a uh, uh, conference and invite from the fishermen to the uh, Mario of the city. I hope many people come and discuss these questions. What does it mean? You see here some of me with some of the residents. You see that there are a lot of artists in this area. It's a fish of the metal, a fish of plastic. So, coming to the conclusion. Short one. We went from apocalyptic discourse to climate change as practice. And then we big long climate discourses to work on the refugees. It's important to materialize climate change. To figure out it is somehow real. It's very difficult to figure out climate change. Because you're always caught in biopower. You want to be normal, you want to be good, you want to be the right thing. You're, you're permanent in that trap. It's difficult to find out how can I do what I really want to in terms of climate change. For me it's difficult. We permanently think about that. Climate change has a history. And democracy has to change. It's not top down. It's not the technology organizing it. It's not equal dictatorship organizing what people do. Because landscapes and people do what landscapes and people do, and that's the beginning and end of everything. We have to figure out. Maybe that uh, is why I assist anthropologists who try, anthropologists who try to figure out what it means. Does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be non-human? What is a tie? How do we contain a tie? A tie we need better start doing. So, I hope you enjoyed it. Exhausted his full code of 45 minutes. We can save the questions and remarks for the QA session. And also, since we are running a little late, I would request you all to please keep the debate as short as possible. Let's try and reassemble in five minutes for the next one. Thank you.
Mr. Kachi has a wealth of experience in climate policy. He's been uh, working with UNFCC, European Union, several other multinationals, and even with national and uh, local agencies on topics of uh, carbon pricing and climate financing. Uh, he has uh, his areas of uh, his areas of interest include. Uh, carbon pricing, climate financing, uh, institutional strengthening, and in his current role at New Climate Institute, he's focusing on how to, uh, or he's researching on the uh, global financial flows into the Paris Agreement. And in line with that today, he's going to talk about the future of carbon markets under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, Akikachi. On behalf of the Central Program Division of Forest Science and Research Management, I welcome you. Thank you. Yours, yours. <laughs> to neoliberal ideas about <laughs> commodities and incentives and economics and policy and stakeholders and laws and command and control and how to affect behavior to reduce emissions to fight climate change. Um, it's a very quick overview of the content, but I'm not going to We'll through that right now. Um, I think I'll start out with this slide. How many people know what carbon offsets are, or carbon trading, or emissions trading? How many people, when they go on vacation somewhere for a uh, weekend or a conference in Paris, click on a little button on the website of an airline? and buy certificates and say, I want to offset my flight. A couple of people. Good number of people. Uh, so carbon trading and offsets are something abstract, and it's something that exists on the UN level, in the UNCCC level. It exists on a, a different form in the EU, in the form of emissions trading scheme in the EU, and cap and trade. Um, I'm going to focus on kind of uh, the UN level right now, um, but I think even if you don't actively think about clicking on that little button on the KLM or EasyJet or Ryanair or Lufthansa or German Wings website, how many people have sent a package with DHL? A couple people. How many people have noticed this little go green message there? How many believe that they are setting their package climate neutrally? <laughs> you don't trust it. You don't trust it. Who said that? Raise your hand. No, I just said that you don't trust it. Okay. But you believe it. Tell me why. Um, I've heard the guys speak before from the Green Initiative. Mm -hmm. And I know how they say it's a CO2 fresh game. Oh, CO2 neutral by the transportation that I think in total is CO2 neutral by this offset. Um, I'm going to dive into a little bit of these questions about how that works and how that has worked up until now and how it may change a little bit after 2020 with the Paris Agreement. Um, but I think it's, it's something that is was a fairly recent invention, um, but now it's on every airline website almost. It's on Deutsche Post, it's, a, it's in every post office. Uh, you can bury Ben & Jerry's. When you buy Ben & Jerry's ice cream now, they buy offsets, so well, Ben & Jerry's, I think, is, is not, is planning to be, or already is a climate neutral company, right? Um, there's also voluntary off offsetting. You can 
when, if you don't trust what KLM does, uh, you can also go to a, a, a website called Atmosphere and they do a slightly different calculation and they invest in their own project. Uh, Shadow is also going to start selling highly neutral fossil fuels. Right? <laughs> um, this is that's something that has been happening under the UNFCCC, so there's a kind of a UN seal of approval on it. Uh, gold standards, they have come up with a voluntary standard to improve on what they see it might have been some problems with the UNFCCC and improve and, and expand on it. And um, the uh, ICAO, which stands for the International Civil Aviation, Civil Aviation Organization, which is the UN organization that governs tra air travel around the world, has come up with a scheme called the Carbon Offsetting Redu Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, where the goal of that is to have climate neutral growth from 2020 levels into the future. And that doesn't mean that people are going to fly less under the scheme, but the idea is that for each additional ton emitted from 2020 level, we measured how many emissions were in 2020, airlines are going to be forced to buy offsets to compensate for their <coughs> um, but the, the offsetting is something that's fairly new, but it's there, and it's everywhere suddenly. You go to the post office, you eat ice cream, it's there. Um, but I think with, with the Paris Agreement, this kind of fundamental new era in climate change making policy and the global effort to make something uh, happen to reduce climate change or fight climate change. Um, and it's really sort of the first time that we agree at least on some high abstract level that, well, the two degree goal we had already, we had it started in Copenhagen and Cancun, which was kind of negotiations at the UN level a few years previous to that. Um, but now we have an addition of 1.5, or best efforts to get to 1.5. We know that in order to get that from, from the IPCC, we need to balance emissions and sinks by around 2050. So that means basically we need to decarbonize, and when we don't decarbonize, we need to somehow figure out how to suck out of the air the methane, the CO2, the HFCs, etc., etc. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do that through a system of nationally determined contributions. So every most countries in the EU, there's an EU nationally de determined contribution. But most countries come up to the UN and they say, I'm going to reduce 10%, 5%, 50%. Some countries have said more, some countries have said less. And it, it's a little bit hard to compare these commitments because some of them say, well, by 2030, I would have emitted this much, and I'm going to reduce from that. Um, but that may not be a reduction from what it is today, but it's a reduction of what they think it would have been by the 2050, given, or 2030, given economic growth, given population growth, given uh, people rising out of poverty, people using more energy, people buying cars, wanting to take an easy jet flight somewhere for the weekend, etc., etc. Um, so it's, it's often it's, it's always a reduction from a theoretical baseline, a theoretical what might have happened or what might happen in, the, in 2050, 2030, 2025. Some of these NDCs have different um, target years. Um, but there's also a system of sort of pledge and review under the Paris Agreement where uh, at least every five years, every country is supposed to come back to the UN and say, uh, I've done this much progress, I've achieved this much to, to reach my commitment, um, and I can do this much more for the next five years, or I have been really, really successful in reducing emissions. I've replaced all of my cars with bike sharing schemes. 
I have replaced all my flights with trains, uh, and I can reduce my emissions even more, and I can increase the ambition of my goal even more. And the idea is that as we move through time towards 2050, so 2020, 2025, 2030, we get more ambition, and you see what other people are doing, and you see technology improving, and you have this kind of like stop taking effect and a ratcheting effect. The idea is that you're, you're not supposed to be able to reduce your ambition, but every time you come back to the international kind of negotiations at the UN, you increase that ambition, right? Um, New Climate Institute is part of an initiative called the Climate Action Tracker. Uh, I, I don't know if someone is, some people are familiar with it. I noticed that one of the posters has a little uh, uh, screenshot of it on their on the poster. The Climate Action Tracker tries to make sense of what all of these nationally determined contributions, what all these countries' promises to the world actually means in terms of emissions overall. Um, and unfortunately, right now, we estimate that although the world has committed to a below 2 degree, well below 2 degree, with best efforts for a 0.5 degree goal, with current policies, we're more on track for 3.3, maybe upwards to 4. Um, but actually, interestingly enough, current policies are more ambitious than current pledges and targets, right? So the NDCs, if, are, if they're all implemented, uh, are they less, they're less ambitious at the moment, but they could be actually, depending on how they're implemented, they could be, um, get us almost to where the, where the NDC is. But basically, the point is that if you add up all these common promises of all the different countries in the world, we're not going to get to the two degree goal. We're going to get to mm, two and a half, four. We don't know. There's lots of uncertainty. Lots of, we don't know exactly how our policies are going to affect things on the ground. Um, but we're, we're not where we need to be. Um, and in the Paris Agreement, there is a provision for these offset things called, the, called Article 6. Um, and the idea is kind of voluntary cooperation between two countries, right? And you can see it on a country level. You can say Germany and Nigeria, or the U well, US, I don't know about that, but Canada and Thailand. Um, but basically, the idea is that through voluntary cooperation, we're going to work together uh, through carbon markets. It doesn't say that explicitly, but this is supposed to help us get to higher ambition. Um, and there's a lot of technical language about how we're going to do that. Um, one, one way is what's called cooperative approaches, which is kind of vague what exactly that means, but it means that two countries if they work together, maybe they can achieve something ideally better than what they could do otherwise. Um, well, the Article 6.4 mechanism, which is kind of a, the next generation of the clean development mechanism, which is sort of the, the offsetting scheme, or the main offsetting scheme of, of the UNFCCC at the moment. How many people are familiar with the clean development mechanism? Um, but basically, so the Paris Agreement was, we, we came together in Paris in 2015, we have this agreement. Now, last year in Katowice, we, we finished most of the negotiations on what the, we would call the Paris Rulebook. Um, but one bit of the Paris Rulebook about how we are going to compare what all the different countries are doing and help countries that need capacity building international finance to achieve these goals. Um, and how we're going to check yeah, what, what different countries are doing. One, one piece of this puzzle is missing, and that is the rules governing these carbon markets under the Paris Agreement for after 2020. Um, 
And basically, I'm, I'm going to start with a little bit of a history behind the computer protocol. Um, and that was signed. Is that chalk? No. <coughs> That was, that was signed in 1997, right, in Kyoto, there's a lot of problem, And the problem is that in 1997 we didn't know exactly what relation, we knew that greenhouse gases were causing global warming, but we didn't know exactly how much we needed to reduce, how fast, how fast of an impact that would have, what are the tipping points, et cetera, et cetera. And it took a while for countries to sign up for the Kyoto Protocol, right? So it took from 1997, when we agreed on the Kyoto Protocol, to 2005 for this UN treaty to take effect. And the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol was only for developed countries, which, yeah, so what we'll call rich countries, and they only made a commitment for a time period from 2008 to 2015, no, to 2012. Um, and different countries took different commitments under that. Um, most of them measured compared to a baseline in 1990. Uh, and it was very different for different countries. Some countries said, okay, well, I, will I would have increased this much in the period from 2008 to 2012, uh, but I want to reduce some of that, so that's my contribution to the world. So in Germany, for example, Germany made a commitment to reduce 21% over that period from 1990 levels. Right, so by 2012, the idea is that we're going to be 21% uh, less fewer emissions than we had in 1990. Um, and in the interest of economic efficiency, so it's better to do things more efficient than less efficient, right? No one likes to waste money. The idea is that, or was, that if someone else can reduce emissions more cheaply than I can, that it makes sense for me to pay them to do it rather than for me to reduce emissions. Right? That's the basic fundamental idea of, of carbon trading. If, so, if someone, for the, for the, in terms of the global climate change phenomenon, it doesn't matter if a ton of CO2 is emitted in India or Canada, it only matters that it's reduced. And if I can reduce it somewhere else more cheaply than in one place, then it makes sense for the person that has the, faces the higher costs to pay the person that faces lower costs to do it for them. Um, one issue with this under the Kyoto Protocol is what happened around 1990. 1989, 1990, 1991. Eastern and Western Germany reunited. Yeah. So that, that, that happened in Germany, but also more, yeah? I mean, the main thing is Soviet Union fell, and then the Cold War stuff then. So it, 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 it's part of the same phenomenon, right? So the, so the Iron Curtain fell. Francis Fukuyama said it's the end of history. The communism is over. We're all going to move to a market economy. Um, but also, what really fundamentally happened in terms of the economies in a lot of former communist countries, uh, in Russia, in East Germany, in a lot of the Eastern European countries, is that the economy fell apart, right? Communism, a planned economy, no market forces, resources are inefficiently allocated. Um, when that communist system falls apart, market forces come in, and all those efficiencies get swept away, and companies go bankrupt because they were making something that people didn't need because some bureaucrat told them to, but not because anyone wanted to buy the product. And so the economy falls apart, and the emissions go down massively. 
right? So what does it mean uh, to reduce, is, is a commitment of 21% reduction, is that a commitment? I mean, does that mean from 2008 to 2012, Germany is going to need to make a real effort to reduce emissions? And not only that, they're going to not, but if Germany found that it was too expensive to reduce emissions, they could buy ink, like uh, surplus rights or surplus reductions from Eastern, Eastern Europe, Estonia, Bulgaria, Russia, Ukraine. Um, and, and their economies also fell apart. So these things were very, very cheap. And on the whole, some countries did reduce a lot of their emissions. Uh, not everyone reduced their emissions uh, on purpose. Um, compared to this 1998 slide, right? So you're fine. You're, you're suddenly in 2008. Um, and what happened in you know, 2010, 2011, 2012? No, a little bit earlier. 2008. 2000, yeah, 2008, 2009. Financial crisis. Global financial crisis. What happened in Europe in, in that? There's a euro crisis, right? And the euro crisis especially affected countries like Greece and Italy and Portugal and Spain. Also affected Germany, but also massively reduced emissions. In, in in this in this time span. Now we're now the economy the global economy is growing again, but we had a massive dip in, in global emissions. And especially in, in, in a lot of uh, European countries and other other countries. So we had a question about it, are are German emissions rising right now? Yeah. Uh, basically if you look from the nineteen ninety level if you add East Germany and West, former East Germany and former West Germany together, and the German emissions were like this, they went down like this for a long time, and then sort of from the 2012 level, and then they're kind of stable, and now we're going up again. And that's happening in a lot of countries. Um, but we need to reduce, right? And the EU has a reduction target. Um, and one of, but do we need to reduce our own emissions or can we pay someone else to reduce their emissions for us? This is the question that uh, this abstraction between our actual own emissions that are measured by a greenhouse gas inventory and the target that we, we have made for the international community. Um, you can make that abstraction and separate the, our own emissions from the achievement of the target through carbon markets. Um, so if, let's say, I am the EU, or I am Germany, Germany doesn't have an NDC, so let's say I am the EU, and my business as usual emissions are X, um, so that means if I didn't do anything about climate change, if I just let the economy take its course, um, but I, I promise to reduce my emissions by half, right, so 50% cut, but I actually only reduce my emissions by 25%. Can I still reach my goal? Yes, I can reach my goal if someone else overachieves their target. So let's say... Myanmar, Burma, um, would have reduced their emissions by 25%, but they reduced their, their emissions by 50%. This overachievement of that target can be sold, and then we can all reach our targets together. This works in theory. Um, it's a little bit hard, 
under the parachute, under the under the, parent, under the, under the Kyoto Protocol, we had fixed targets, right? You do this in this period, I do that in this period, and if we overachieve it, or if you overachieve it, I can buy this request, that's great. But unfortunately, we couldn't agree on a continuation for the Kyoto Protocol after 2012. Uh, there was a breakdown in climate negotiations in Copenhagen. We couldn't agree, couldn't agree, couldn't agree. We fast forward to the Paris Agreement. Um, not only do, under the Paris Agreement, does everyone have targets, not only rich countries, um, but we also have a system for long-term commitments and a long-term ratchet program to kind of increase the ambition of our commitments constantly through time. Um, and then the Paris Agreement, we've all agreed to peak and, and reduce our own emissions as soon as possible, reduce them reduce some time after, and then decarbonize this, this century, this, this latter half of the century. Um, and then basically this, this system is supposed to yeah, increase the emission and increase how many emissions we're going to reduce every time we get together to talk about that. But when we talk about um, reductions, I mean, it, 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 it is a question like, what about, what, how much of this reduction is effort, and how much of it just happened because of an economic crisis? Or because mm, vegetarian became, eating vegetarian became popular and people stopped eating meat, and so there were fewer cows for big methane. Maybe some of it was effort, maybe some of it just happened because of coincidence, because of an economic crisis, etc., etc. What a, it's a reduction from the baseline, but how much of that reduction is through this cooperation? And this kind of cooperation, it's fairly important that that cooperation has led to this reduction. So in a lot of cases, under the Kyoto Protocol, there's a lot of reduction, but these corporate markets didn't necessarily always lead to those reductions. And uh, th that something is like, how do we know that my intervention has reduced emissions in another country? How do I know that when I click on that button on KLM or EasyJet, or how do I know that I eat, when I eat Ben and Jerry's instead of Hagen does, that that purchase has led to a reduction somewhere in a different country. It's really critical that this, this concept is called additionality. Is that, is that investment really additional to what would have otherwise happened in a counterfactual scenario? And, and in order to prove that, it's actually impossible to prove because by the act of making that investment, I am making sure that an alternative reality will not happen. Does that kind of make sense? So you can't prove something that has not happened by definition because I have made it not happen, but it may have happened anyway. This is, I think, very appropriate for a school of forestry. <laughs> um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But obviously, I mean, in a lot of places, if you just leave nature to do its thing, forests will grow, or black grasslands will return. We don't really need to be paying people to be planting trees everywhere. In some cases, maybe trees wouldn't have grown back as fast. In some cases, they wouldn't grow in the same way, but nature takes its course if we just let nature do its thing. I mean, it's a little more complicated if you stop allowing people to farm in certain regions or have conservation programs that reduce the dependency on certain people to cut down the forest and you get an alternative livelihood, etc. Et et um, but basically, the idea is that for additionality to be to prove that there, to make sure that an investment has reduced in an emission, 
we need to be sure that uh, that risk emission reduction would not have happened without us. And it's a little bit complicated um, under the Paris Agreement when not only has the technological progression happened or economic crises happen, but we have all committed to reduce all of our emissions. And we've all admit committed to be as ambitious as we can to reduce all of our emissions. So if I'm going to invest in a uh, solar electrification program in India, um, and those people would have otherwise, and I'm going to do that with PV panels, and those people might have otherwise used electricity from the grid that was powered by coal. Um, I need to know that not only would those people not have invested in their PV panels themselves, but now in the Paris Agreement, I need to know that the Indian government would not have had its own electric solar rural electrification program and done it by itself. This is it's very complicated in the Paris Agreement when we all committed to, to reduce all our emissions to decarbonize by the second half of the century, to all be as ambitious as we can. Um, but not only that, for projections of what people will actually do and how fast they will invest in renewable energy, for example, are constantly wrong. The International, the International Energy Agency has come up with a number of projections for, uh, this is annual installations of, I believe, yeah, solar PV and wind. So in 2006, they thought we were going to have gigawatts installed, installed by year like this. In 2000, but, but like, in, by 2005, six, we were already there. And they, didn't, they predicted we wouldn't get there until 2010. So they revised their projections in 2008, and 2009, and 2010, and 2011, and 2012. And look what happened to actual solar PV um, installations around the world. Right? This has happened partially because PV has gotten really, 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 really cheap. It's one of the cheapest ways to produce electricity now. Similar story with wind. We, we thought we would be, or the, the International Energy Agency, which is sort of the global authority on, on energy projections in the world, thought we would be doing this from 2010 to 2025, in 2006. In 2008, they thought it would decline. In 2009, oh, but it's not happening. And not only that, but we're overreaching all our goals every year. A year after year after year, and yet, and and they're revising their their um, estimations for global projections year after year after year after year. So investment behavior has a lot to do with technological change. It has a lot to do with economic forces. It has a lot to do with global financial flows. It has a lot to do with like awareness about what we should be doing about climate change and random behaviors and fads. Um, and has a lot to do with technological uptake, right? So how do I know that the villagers in India wouldn't have installed those solar panels for themselves? I can probably guess maybe if they, if it's a very poor village and the upfront cost of that little TV panels are very high, it's unlikely that they, they can afford the upfront cost even if the uh, even if they would save money over time. Um, but the technological uptake of different technologies continues to surprise us. Um, it's very interesting that from 1990, it, a fixed line telephone took a very, very long time for every household to almost get them in the United States. Compare a fixed line telephone to a cell phone. Whoop. Who would have predicted that a cell phone would have taken off like that? Who would have predicted that Apple's iPhone would supplant the Nokia bigger brick phones, the dumb phones that just can't check your email that fast? 
Who would have predicted that radio would have taken off that fast? Who would have predicted cold dryers would have taken off that fast? These things are very, very hard to predict. Um, and yet, in terms of a lot of technologies that reduce emissions, it's really great that they're being taken up, right? It's fantastic that wind is getting cheap, that PV is getting cheap, and we really need to support that transition. We need to support the whole world to basically move from oil and coal and gas to renewables and electric cars. Um, and it's interesting because, I mean, the people who look at technological um, progression and, and and look at how people adopt these technologies, think that there are, there are certain points in, in the course of technology, of technology that uh, sort of change the whole market, right? At some point, iPhone or Apple comes up with a new technology and no one wants a Motorola anymore. The whole society moves towards smartphones and tablets <coughs> So when we have laptops, no one has one of these massive desktops with computers on, it, on their desk anymore, okay? Um, and it makes sense that the additionality that when people won't do something unless I pay them, so that, that, that technology uptake needs support for a certain amount of time, um, but once that but once that transformation point is reached, maybe the whole market changes and, and we move to a different reality. We don't watch black and white televisions anymore. We watch color televisions anymore. Maybe we don't even watch television anymore because we're all watching Netflix, right? Um, the whole landscape changes very, very fast. And maybe we don't need to pay anyone to watch Netflix because they've already decided that Netflix is better than normal TV. Maybe they've already decided that a, a laptop is better than a desktop computer. Maybe they've already decided that a Tesla is better than a uh, Jeep Cherokee or a, I don't know, Mercedes SUV that runs on diesel. Um, so at some point, we can think that that payment that we're giving to them is reducing emissions, reducing emissions, reducing emissions, because they wouldn't have adopted that technology anyway. Up until a certain transformation point, tipping point, pivot point, that we could basically say. And then the effort that we need to put into that, the investment that we need to put into sort of incentivizing, subsidizing people to do a certain thing, isn't needed anymore, and we can get rid of it, and the technology will take off. The emission reduction will be made without me investing in that project anymore. And ideally, I mean, the good news is that we're very close to this point. If we're not, if not, if we're probably at this point already for solar PV and wind. We're not there for electric cars yet. We're not there for climate neutral concrete production or steel production or international aviation, right? We don't have electric airplanes yet. They're run on electricity that was generated by renewables. Um, but the good news is that we're basically there for PV and for PV and wind. Um, but part of this additionality calculation about like, would they have done that if I hadn't paid them? And not only that, but like, would the government not have done their own incentive scheme had, because the government has already committed to the Paris Agreement and is committed to uh, implementing ambitious policy. I need to know that this is something that would not have happened without my payment. That's hard to know with different technologies. They take off at different speeds. Um, and yet, it's very important that under the Paris Agreement, Article 6 says that we have these market things, we have this ability to trade emissions or trade emission reductions in order to increase ambition. 
And the classical understanding of that is, I can increase ambition if the costs are lower. I have a certain amount that I can spend on climate change mitigation. And if I can reduce more emissions with that amount, then I can maybe reduce, increase my ambition. Right? If I can do, if it's way cheaper than I expected, then I can increase my ambition a lot. Um, but when someone is paid to do something, what does that do to their incentive structures? Let's say I smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. Titania smokes three packs of cigarettes a day. And we come up with a deal that we're not going to, not only going to increase the number of cigarettes that we're smoking every day, but we're both going to reduce, or no, I, I say I'm going to reduce the number of cigarettes I, I smoke every day, but, but really, that I come up with a deal saying what really matters is the total number of cigarettes that anyone smokes. And maybe I have a very stressful day and I decide to smoke 15 cigarettes, and I pay Titania to smoke five less cigarettes. So that deal means that we have reached our total targets in terms of the number of cigarettes we smoked. But how do I know that uh, he didn't get emphysema and we're going to quit anyway? Or, yeah, or the government in, in, in ruling that, that creates policies in, in Germany where we both live, hasn't increased the taxes on cigarettes and made it more expensive for us all. It's very important under the Paris Agreement that when I make a payment that I am not only reducing, but also encouraging the commitment of someone else to increase their ambition. That's what Article 6 says. And that's hard to, that's hard, that's a kind of a soft thing to, to judge, right? How, how much should Germany do, should the UK do, should the US do? And there's, there's a major question of global injustice because of that, because industrial countries have emitted a lot of tons of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere historically. And poor countries have not. And a lot of our development model right now, in terms of becoming rich and pulling people out of poverty, is dependent on creating more greenhouse gas emissions. So I spent a lot of time trying to think, like, how do I, it, it, is my pain trying to smoke five cigarettes less? What does that do to his ambition to reduce his number of cigarettes that he smokes? Would, would he tell me that he would have smoked 15, um, but I, I'm, it's, but when in reality he would have smoked five in order to get me to pay him to reduce five? This is, this is kind of a fundamental question around carbon markets right now. Um, and some colleagues and I have, have come up with a research paper, and we think that it's, it's in terms of technologies and in terms of costs, it's probably reasonable to assume, this is a little bit fuzzy, that mature technologies are something that countries should be able to do for themselves. Emerging technologies, that's something that we can incentivize and, and that will create more ambition. And if we normalize PV in Thailand, then we, the Thailand can increase their own ambition. Low-hanging fruit, cheap ways to reduce emissions, or even emission reduction strategies or implementation or activities that can have actually a positive balance sheets uh, hang out, could be reserved to something for the, a country's own NDC, whereas markets might be able to better incentivize some things that countries really genuinely would never have been able to afford by themselves. Um, and one interesting thing is, 
I don't know what kind of lights these are. But a few years ago, the EU and the US decided that for normal light bulbs, we're not going to have incandescent bulbs. Okay? Incandescent bulbs are very energy inefficient. They use a lot of energy, a lot of electricity to create a certain amount of light, and a lot of heat gets wasted. LEDs, we didn't think that they were going to become that cheap that fast. I don't know if that's actually in this graph. Uh, but basically, LEDs have become very, very cheap, very, very fast. And they have become something over here when the CDM said at one point it was over here. So there were CDM projects in a lot of countries where people went out into villages and said, stop using this light, it's wasting electricity, I'm going to give you this new and improved light bulb. Uh, and it's going to save you energy, it's going to save electricity and save emissions. And, but suddenly the whole world changed. Countries stopped producing incandescent light bulbs and LEDs became the cheapest option. So this is, are those reducing emissions? And it's different, different for different projects and different activities and different technologies. But for something that we can really say for sure that countries wouldn't have done them themselves because they can't afford it because it's an immature technology that's very risky. It's something that may, if it changes the technological landscape in that country, uh, be able to increase ambition. Whereas paying countries to do something they would have ended down in a way is not really a reduction. This becomes a little bit complicated in terms of voluntary offsetting because we're moving towards a world where my emissions, it's very hard to like isolate what are my emissions compared to someone else's emissions. And if I, if I own a car, I don't own a car, but if I own a car and I drive that car, let's say it's a gasoline car, then those are my emissions. Um, but what if I fly a, fly a plane? Are those my emissions, or are those the emissions of the, of the airplane? Or the of, of KLM or Lufthansa? Or are the emissions of the, of the fuel provider? And there's a, there's a trend in kind of carbon footprinting and figuring out how many emissions are, are embedded in a certain product that goes beyond my own emissions into figuring out how much electricity is it going to take, how much gasoline or diesel did it take to transport that product from the other side of the world to me. And this is a little bit different than the kind of accounting for greenhouse gas emissions that we have in the Triple C, where, where if there's a coal plant in Texas, that's a US emission, and if there's a coal plant in Mexico, that's a Mexican emission, even if there's a, a transfer of electricity between the two. Um, yeah, that's just to make the point that, that in, in terms of voluntary markets, in terms of voluntary commitments from DHL, from Ben and Jerry's, to reduce emissions, they're thinking more and more about. Uh, the whole footprint of their goods, which is good. Um, but it, it's different than the UFCCC accounting of these things, um, which makes the carbon credit transfers of these uh, carbon markets a little bit more complicated. Uh, if anyone has some specific questions about that, uh, you can let me know. But basically, yeah. Let me know, come up, come up to me afterwards. Um, and then I, I want to leave you with a kind of conceptual question. In terms of reductions from a theoretical baseline, in terms of paying someone to not do something that they might have done otherwise, uh, or in, specifically in terms of paying someone to not admit something, whether or not they would have admitted it, emitted it otherwise. I think it's very different to pay for an actual negative emission. And I think that this, this distinction has not been really made in the world of carbon markets. We don't make a difference between I have 
paid this company in, in Switzerland to suck a ton of CO2 out of the air, or I have paid a project developer in India to electrify 10,000 villages. But I think that this is, this is a distinction that's, that's coming and then, and then needs to happen because it's a little bit more clear that had I not paid this company to run this type of time out CO2 out of there, they wouldn't have done it. Whereas a reduction from a theoretical baseline uh, from a theoretical baseline or ultimate reality somewhere else is a little bit less short. And this is the where we are in the Paris Agreement. We don't know, we don't have the rules, we can't agree. Maybe we'll agree at the upcoming climate negotiations in Bonn in June and or Santiago in, in December. Um, but stay tuned. <laughs> we'll see. lose that investment that they could have run for 20 years. And it would have been cheaper for me to take that money that I would have, that I would have lost and help someone else move, leapfrog, to renewable energy. Um, I think it has become something where I don't want to take the train for 12 hours to Paris. To the song. I, it's easier to fly, and then and I want to fly, but I don't want it to have that bad of an impact on the climate. So it's 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 a way of compensating for for those emissions. Or I really like to eat hamburgers. Or I really like to drive an SUV. And it's become a way to, and I mean, and in some in, in some cases, it's 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 a it's a question of some emissions are really generally very hard to get rid of. So steel production, cement production, agricultural emissions, the way most agriculture is done, the way in the world right now, is very very hard to get rid of. That's very different than reducing emissions in electricity 
so if I, if, I mean, the habits are a lot harder to change than, than, than paying someone else to reduce emissions. So this, the, the idea is that uh, you can kind of still be able to cancel out that effect um, without changing behaviors too much. Or, or if you can't change the behavior, then at least you can do X to, to neutralize that effect. Uh, do you think that strategy is working? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I mean, I think that under the Paris Agreement, where everyone is committed to do as much as they can and increase their ambition every time, it's very hard to predict what they would have done otherwise. Okay, so, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say that the, the, this idea of carbon markets is, is fundamentally bad, and I think that. There are good projects that would not have happened otherwise. Um, but a lot of projects probably would have happened otherwise. Or the, what they've been missed, they've in, like, estimated the reductions. Uh, it's an overestimation. Um, and I think it, in a lot of cases, it has facilitated us not needing to change the way we produce electricity live our lives, go on vacation, what we eat. Um, it's in, in, a, in a world where we all need to do carbonization, there, there's a very limited role for, for that offsetting in terms of reductions, um, which is why I wanted to leave with that, that uh, the thought about it. It's very different to be sucking commission, uh, greenhouse gas emissions out of the air. But right now it's very expensive. And uh, there's no way that it makes sense to do it right now because it's so much easier to just reduce our own emissions at the moment than to be sucking a lot of carbon greenhouse gases. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, my name is Maggie, and I have also a question to Mr. Kirchhoff. Um, so, would you say that paying for these carbon off offsets to EasyJet or whatever, do you think that is actually contributing something positive? Like, are they making these changes, or is it more like giving an extra two to five euros to the company? And then, onto that, um, do you know if yes, if they are doing something, what is that? Is that just paying someone to to plant trees, or is it investing in new technology, or? Yeah. So w w one issue is the transparency of these things is, is, is not very good. So in a, for some of these programs, when you click on that, you don't know what they're investing in. You don't know how much of that investment, when, or the, well, of your payment when, when it's a market date for that thing, or how much of it is actually a racket on the ground. Uh, some of them, I think, definitely do make a difference on the ground in some places. Um, but there's a vast difference, there are vast differences in the quality of these things. Um, and it's, there are ways to calculate, and these things are, some of them are updated better than others, or more, more often than others. Uh, one thing that we can really be totally sure of is that it's, it's much better to reduce your emissions before you think about, or as in uh, reducing your own emissions has to be the focus, and then maybe the uncertainty aside, you can do something in addition. Um, but I, I, it's important not to pretend that my carbon footprint is totally cancelled out by, by going through that process. But I mean, do you, do you, when you when you're going to Sheffield or to to France, do you do you click on? on I will ask those who buy the Yeah, I don't know. Do universities do it? Some, some universities, pay. in this case, I don't know. The German government does. So for every official business trip for the German government, I think, does Prime University do it? I, I, I have to ask. <laughs> Public money cannot be spent on offsetting. 
I participate in a program and they cannot offset anything if you're just so they don't. normal person, they don't. They don't. Wait, so could you repeat that again? Um, if you're just in a project funded with public money, they cannot offset. Mm -hmm. They cannot use public money for that at the moment. But for bureaucrats, with the business trips of bureaucrats, they can. Maybe. I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> the Umwelt Bundesamt. Yeah, the official politicians. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so the So maybe to you both, try to combine. So basically, what I understood from your talk, uh, Aki, is that um, these agreement-oriented politics are, have a very high transaction costs and like high non-transparency. Does this um, bring you to question um, this? multinational, international agreements process in itself? And is there a kind of, because these are two different approach, approaches, so there's just like more into this climate practice oriented, you see it locally, you see the effects of what you're doing locally. Do you see any kind of um, concept in between where you might be in, Investing for offsetting in more new local projects or something like that. Uh, yeah. So this is like a the of the It's different scales. Yeah. It's thinking on different scales. I, I mean, uh, it's global level, but global actors. And uh, in Paris, it's the global community or something, or other nations. In the coastal village, it's some people, it's completely different levels. And of course there are many different, many, uh, it's a scalar thing. The climate is of huge complexity, and so it's not possible to control. I think sustainability is a, a similar thing. Either you think it in terms of controlling, or you think it in terms of complexity. In this case, it's better to have a complexity, so it's not really comparable. But we disagree on a certain point. If you think flat earth, there are sellers and producers, and sellers and buyers all over the world. People in India and Africa and in Germany are the same. They sell, they offer something. So it's a flat earth, totally without any differences. And it's based on assumptions what it means to be human. You guys want to sell something, you guys want to buy something, you guys want to trip around. So it's a very Western thing. Um, it's, it's economy based. You know, it's not economy based, it's a certain kind of Western economy. Every person wants to profit from something. I seriously doubt that people are like that. They like to say it, or they like to pretend to do. People I know who take care of all the time, they do non profit stuff, they take care of the children, for the parents. Want to explore. There are many other people too. But, uh, it's, it's based on a flat earth and based on a certain assumption of how people are. There's an experience level. Maybe it works or it does not work. I'm not judge now. There's something very simple about it. Because we are not, we do not exist. There are people who are more exploited than others. You know, developing which countries? You know, people profit from the deal and people do not profit. But I think the connection between the, that local level and the global level is that, I mean, the, the, those NDCs are not adding up to the overall temperature goals of the Paris Agreement because politicians don't believe that, if, that climate change is going to win them votes. And they don't think that taking action on climate change is popular and if they are going to walk around telling people not to eat meat, not to drive internal combustion cars, not to, not to fly, they're not going to win elections. 
And until we kind of move to this democratic movement of Greta Thunberg and, and kind of people wanting that and demanding that on a local level, politicians will not be moving all any of those policies on the local level. And, and, we, and these NDCs, countries come up with them and they send them to the UN because they're kind of involved in this UN process. But the, the connection between those kind of negotiations and where they meet in, 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 in Poland and Chile around the world every year, and then the actual on the ground what governments are doing, what communities are doing, it's, it's so abstract that the, there's, no, there's no translation, either pressure on the politicians going up or politicians generally on the, on the global level to, to do something about emissions on the ground. Um, yeah, like I, I don't know much about this uh, carbon market, and like my, my question is, um, is that, um, yeah, who, who's actually selling this uh, carbon reduction? Um, like this, uh, these are the countries, right? Or, or like, or what? If I want to sell them, like, what, what do I need to do? Uh, well, there, I mean, there, there are a couple levels. Uh, what I was mostly talking about on this level is that it's usually uh, a project developer or a company that goes in and says, okay, look at this landfill in this country. It's, there's decomposing waste in that that's producing methane. I'm going to capture that and destroy it. Um, I'm going to measure how many times of methane I've destroyed and I can sell those as credits. Okay. So it's usually a company. And but then this, like something behind, because like the end mentioned that the, there's no like uh, conversion, like this company like planted 100 trees and therefore now we have like this amount of less carbon in the atmosphere. But there must be something like this, right? Yeah, so different programs have different levels of transparency. There, are, I mean, generally there, there are. There's a way to. There's a registry. There's a. There's and a. And who controls this, uh, these calculations? Like, is there like an independent agency who is like I don't know, looking at, at, at these calculations, or is it just like a company who says? It? So on the UN level, there, there is there are methodologies that say, okay, we're 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 going to measure it based on this and this and this and this. And and say that this is the baseline and we've reduced this much. Um, those methodologies are maybe not updated as, as fast as they could have, should have been. And I think they often don't keep up with technology or technological progression. So yes, I mean, if the, if the, those projects exist on the ground. Um, that project developer, if you bought a credit from them, I have no reason to doubt, well, I mean, there, there are some disreputable scams on the internet, but in general, there is a general, genuine project behind that, that someone has actually put a PV panel on a roof somewhere, or put a wind park somewhere. Um, but that, the question is not so much, did, does that project exist, but would someone else have done it anyway? which is a little bit of a different question. Mine's a little bit about the outside of this part. I can practice some restraint. This is a good opportunity. I think this is on the same thing, so you please. Yeah, yeah. since it'll be the last question. Yeah, and that's fine. Discussion. Thanks. OK, so um, my name is Carolina, and I come from Ecuador. And the question is uh, maybe for the both of us. So in Ecuador, a couple of years, a decade ago almost, Rafael Correa, the previous president, decided to uh, state this new conservation uh, a project called the uh, ITT Yasuni Initiative. Okay. So then, at the beginning, of first you, and then you, <laughs> at the beginning of your talk, uh, you said that one of the main issues is that you cannot uh, assess the level of intention of the person or the individual on the other side. 
of saying, oh, would they actually want to exploit the 15, or in this case, the 407 million tons of CO2? And um, the, actually, in my perspective, the deal was pretty nice because it was 400 ton, million tons that were not going to be um, emitted to the atmosphere, right? But uh, regrettably, the initiative couldn't go forward. And there was actually uh, intentions of, of many countries around the world of uh, putting effort on the initiative going forward. But they never explained why was it. So my question to you is, was it actually this was intention on the table? And the second question would be, what is the main discourse? If you're talking about climate change discourse in this kind of initiative not going forward, what kind of discourse will have been the main challenge to um, to defeat in order for it to be to go forward on in a developing country as Ecuador? So. Yeah. So, on one hand, Ecuador is not a super rich country. Yeah, of course. And suddenly you have a huge natural resource that could bring in a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And Venezuela has done it, Canada has done it, Norway has done it, Saudi Arabia has done it. Venezuela not so much, but Norway and Saudi Arabia have become very, very rich by drilling for oil and producing a lot of emissions. Yeah. And on some level, I think it's not unreasonable for Ecuador to say, yeah, this is, look, we have this natural resource. If we're not going to drill for oil and release those emissions, help us comp compensate us for that. I think that, that there is some argument for that. But on the other hand, I mean, Ecuador is also going to suffer from climate change massively. It's already. Is already. We all are. I mean, I, I, there's, there, there are forest fires in Brandenburg in, in April. And that is like, yeah. um, and, and if we all sign up for the Paris Agreement, and we all say we're all going to be as ambitious as I can be, it's also a little bit unfair to blackmail the world and say, pay me, otherwise I'm going to destroy the climate. <laughs> so it's, a, it's not a matter of discourse, it's a matter of practice. You have to do something to save that forest. It's a, it's I mean, discourse is tricky. People uh, never do what they say. So, uh, especially in this kind of negotiations, make the treaty and break the treaty. Discourses are not about practice. They are about conforming to the global community, to the Paris Agreement, to your nation, to whatever. The only thing that's a game changer is the practice of people organized to defend that forest, for example. You have to take action. So you are saying it's actually because they didn't believe the initiative mission and vision. That was why. Because Germany was actually one of the countries that started like saying, okay, we're going to do it. If there's an international trust fund and there's going to be UN people going over these processes, and did happen, but like that was like so. You're saying people just governments didn't decide not to trust anymore. That's what you're saying. So it was like more uh, like a, it's not only discourse about action. It's, I would say it's something more than I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to. No, it's okay. To, to it's pronounce okay. about the morality or the genuine. Promises of the Ecuadorian government. No, yeah, I like I don't like him anymore. Like, I don't <laughs> <laughs> so you can talk about it. It's fine. But <laughs> um, I, I but do you know about that? I yeah, no, I, I I'm very familiar with the initiative. So then, what would you say? Like, just because we're we're not being heard by Basile Gomez right now, so what would you say actually failed? I, if I were someone big and important and had a lot of money, I would say 
don't blackmail me, do uh -huh. the right thing, and maybe I can help you out. Okay. Yeah, okay, you can see it that way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So with that, we bring the Q&A session to a close. Uh, and once again, I would like to thank both our speakers today, because I think it's really uh, special talk in the sense that it's the first time we have uh, two speakers who are uh, neither engineers nor industry <laughs> consultants nor nature scientists. And that on a topic which you mentioned in the start of your talk is very scientifically looked at. Uh, and I'm very happy with that outcome personally and I hope it's the same for the audience. Uh, as, a token, as a small token of our gratitude, uh, my colleague Akin would like to uh, present you with a souvenir. I surely had a lovely time, which I believe my colleagues to surely did. So as a token of our appreciation on behalf of the SRF team, the Forest of Policy and the old participant, we would like to just small <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.